Okay, so just again, just welcome every single one of us online, in person, and just say happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, today I want to talk about, the title of this message is Justice and Justification. Is when, I, when I think about the gospel, when I think about the cross, when I think about what Jesus did, one of my absolute favorite passages of scripture is in Romans chapter 3, and I want to invite you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles there, Romans 3. Um, 25 through 26, I love this passage of Scripture because this passage of Scripture clarifies to us what the gospel is, what the gospel is about. Both from, you know, we often think about the gospel from our perspective and what it means for us, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, justification, imputed righteousness, but a lot of times we don't think about the gospel from God's side, and yet Paul here is telling us why the, God, why the cross was needed from God's perspective. And so a lot of times it's so important that we take, don't, don't just think about the cross from what we get out of it, but the price he paid and why it was needed. So Paul is writing in Romans 3, 25 through 26, and he's, he's making a transition in the book of Romans to, of describing why we are under the wrath of God and that all, all, of, all creation is under the wrath of God. There is no one who is righteous, no, not one, whether Jew or Gentile. There is no one who is righteous. And so Paul makes this transition here in the book of Romans, and, and starting in verse 25, he said, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, and that basically means appeasement. We'll get into this in the message appeasement in his blood, like something in God was appeased in the cross in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Verse 26, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just. Now, I want you to get to this. This is the the title of the message, he would be just and he would be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Justice and justification. Justice and justification. Justification is what we get out of the cross. Justice is the reason God had to do the cross. And, and that's the, what I want to focus on in this message here is justice and justification. The cross of Jesus Christ was the only solution that could solve the predicament that humanity was in because of the fall. Because if God, who is a God of holiness and a God of justice and a God of love and a God of wisdom, if God was to suspend his justice and say, I'm, not, I'm going to overlook your sins, then injustice would prevail. It would seem as if God agreed with, our, with those who despised his, despised his name and spurned his glory. And so th there's no way God could suspend his justice. So God had to execute justice against sin for those who have rebelled against him and broken his commandments and, and defied his word. Now, God could display justice, but if God displayed justice, that means every single one of us would spend eternity in hell because that's the penalty we deserve. But God is a God of love. God is a God who wanted to be in a relationship with us. In fact, he created us to be in a relationship with him. God created us, and this is eternal purpose, God created us so that we could come into the fellowship of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit before time and creation. So that eternal plan and purpose, if, if God was just to execute justice, would be completely thwarted if God just executed justice. But God had to, in his love, come up with a plan in which his justice and his love could be satisfied. So God, in here's the, the, basically the crisis God faced. God's justice demanded he pour out his wrath upon sin. God's love wanted to be in a relationship with us. And so the only solution God could come up with was the cross, where God would pour out his justice upon sin in the body of Jesus Christ, and that he who knew no sin would become sin 
on our behalf and that God would unleash his judgment, even his wrath upon Christ, the wrath and judgment we deserve as our substitute, God, Jesus Christ would absorb that wrath so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. An incredible plan that God devised. Why the cross? Why did God have to do the cross? Why did he have to... Why did, he, why did Christ have to be crucified? Because there's something in God, that the justice and the holiness of God that had to be satisfied. As we talk about God's justice, we've got to understand the, the necessity of atonement. And when Isaiah, you read about it in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah was in, before the throne room of God, and Isaiah was taken up there in this vision, and he saw the Lord. And Isaiah said, I am undone. Isaiah saw the glory of God. Isaiah saw the holiness of God. Isaiah saw the majesty of the king of kings and lord of lords. And he said, and Isaiah said, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah saw the depravity of his own condition. And then a, a seraphim flew and, and touched his lips with coal from fire and said, this has touched your lips. Your sins have been atoned. And so in this encounter with the holiness and the transcendence of God's majesty, Isaiah was, was faced with this reality that the only way I can stand in the presence of a holy God is for atonement to be made. God's holiness we don't understand the holiness of God and our culture anymore. Amen. God's holiness necessitated, demanded, required atonement. Else no creature, creature, no human with a sinful, depraved condition would ever be able to stand in his presence. He's too holy. We would be consumed by God who is a consuming fire. The necessity of atonement. No person can approach the holiness of God without atonement. This brings us to this place of the necessity for sin to be punished. And our culture today, that whatever you want to call it, I don't even know what you call it, godless, lawless, that just thinks sin's not a big deal. Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation tell us the absolute contrary to that idea that sin is a huge deal to God. Sin is a, a, a very serious deal. God who is love, catch this, God who is love, God who wants to so much be in a relationship with us, takes sin so serious that he sends people to eternal separation from him in hell because of the seriousness of sin. See, the, the church today doesn't preach about wrath or hell that much anymore, but we can't really understand the gospel and what the finished work of the cross is about until we come back to that reality. God, in his holiness, must punish sin. From Genesis to Revelation, you see that so clearly. Sin must be punished. But... Uh, we see the picture of this. God, who is love, must punish sin. So it's serious. All sin is serious. And here we come through from Genesis got down into the book of Exodus where God, who wanted to be in a relationship with us, God's eternal purpose before time and creation was to be in a relationship with us, to bring you and me into the fellowship that God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit shared in before time and creation. And so now working out of his eternal plan and purpose, God comes in Exodus. He comes down in that cloud to meet with Moses and he gives Moses the law. And he gives him the Ten Commandments. And in those commandments, 613 commandments, uh, 10 of them um, representative of those 613 commandments, he gives those two tablets of stone to Moses on, in the cloud on Mount Sinai. The law was... A, and a codified expression of the righteous, the absolute righteousness of God. Because of his holiness, 
The law showed what, what God required for us to walk in, to be in a relationship with him, and the severe punishment that would take place if we broke one of those laws. And so that's what the law is. And so in the law you see, and in fact, you, you, know, you read the book of Romans, you realize you can't have the gospel without the law. The law lays down the need for atonement. The law lays down the need for absolute righteousness. And you just reading through the law, I mean, the, the, the severity of the penalty for breaking the law was very intense. I mean, a lot of times it required death. That shows you that God takes, God takes these things very, very serious. And I think we've lost that in the church today of the gravity and the seriousness and the weight of sin against him who is holy. And so in our culture, again, you know, just, just our culture, we are just, our, our, our country is, you know this, we are an absolute mess. It's heartbreaking. I don't want to depress you on Resurrection Sunday, but we are in a mess, but we just have this own version of truth and we just think that it's not, sin's not that big of a deal, but the scriptures tell us no, Sin is a huge deal to God. One act of rebellion is like cosmic treason against the Godhead. One act of sin. God's justice required atonement before sins could be forgiven. Before we could approach a holy God. Before we could come into the fellowship to be what he wanted us to be. Again, another very, um, you know, most churches are preaching the popular things today. I'm preaching the unpopular, hell and wrath. But it's the book of Romans. Amen. Paul says, before Paul got to the gospel, Paul laid out, the, Paul laid out the, that sinners are under God's wrath. And Paul said, God's wrath in, in the book of Romans, you know, we think it's like this, earthquake or war or, you know, just these, you know, asteroids coming down from heaven or whatever it would be, Paul said, no, God's wrath revealed from heaven is God giving people over to what they want. God's wrath is, you want that, I'm not going to restrain you from having that, I'm going to give you over to what you want. That's, that's what Paul's saying in Romans that he gives sinners over in his wrath to what they want and they become more and more hardened until finally God's wrath increases and increases until ultimately God's wrath is eternal separation from God in hell. Now you've got to understand that to understand the gospel. That's clearly laid out in the book of Romans. And Paul is, is communicating this, that, that this is the severity of, of the condition of humanity apart from Jesus Christ. There is no amount of good works we can do. There is no amount of things we can do to be justified in God's sight. There is only one who is, who is worthy. We were singing about There is only one who is worthy, and that's Jesus Christ. And so Paul's building this case in the book of Romans, and Paul is laying it out that that both Jews and Gentiles are all under God's wrath. There is no one righteous, no, not one. He lays out his indictment against depraved Gentiles. He lays out his indictment against self-righteous, self-hypocritical Jews. He lays out his case against, the, and this is talking through the book of Romans, in Romans 2, against the, the, the Jews that break the law. But here's where he's building his case that you cannot understand, you cannot understand the gospel, you cannot understand what Jesus did until you understand that there is no one righteous. There is no one righteous that can stand before God because of God's attitude towards sin. And, and I, I, even this isn't just about pre preaching the gospel, this is about walking in the fear of the Lord in a, as a part of sanctification, as a part of ongoing Christian experience, as a part of ongoing life in the Spirit. God, if, if God paid, if, if God punished his son with such severity on the cross, 
This tells us how much God hates sin. The revulsion of sin. The pride of man enthroning himself in the place of God. God's attitude towards sin. And Paul finally gets to this place in Romans 1, or Romans 3.20. There is no one righteous. No, not one. See, what Paul's laying out in the book of Romans is Paul is telling us all of humanity is unrighteous. All of humanity is under God's wrath. And the only way we could ever be uh, approach a holy God, the only way we could approach his holiness and his presence is for absolute righteousness. And Paul says in Romans 2.13, he said, it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now, yes, that's, that's possible, probably not possible, only by one man, that anyone could keep the law. 613 commandments that we must obey in motive, thought, and deed without breaking one commandment for our entire life. I mean, it is impossible because we don't have the nature to do it. And so God demands absolute righteousness. God demands absolute righteousness. And then in Romans, um, in Romans 3.20, Paul says, By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. In other words, Paul's saying absolute righteousness is required. And then Paul's saying no flesh, no one who has this nature that you have, that we have, can ever stand justified in God's sight. So you see this tension. Absolute righteousness, the impossibility for us to, to ever have absolute righteousness. Apart from Jesus Christ, humanity has no hope. That's the pred predicament that we're in. Now this sounds like, okay, well, you're, you're very negative. Well, it is negative until we get to the gospel. <laughs> and we can't minimize the negativity of it because, well, we want something to tickle our ears. We've got to hear the truth. This, it, the, the, gospel, the gospel is not good news until it's put into the light of what Scripture clearly teaches, that we are under sin, we are under wrath. The demand from God to stand in His presence is absolute righteousness. And one violation of His law, one violation of the 613 commandments of the law in thought, motive, or deed means that we will have to pay the penalty of that, which is death. We're in a, we're in a, without Christ, we are in an absolute impossible situation. But this is the gospel. This is the good news that, that we preach is that we are in this situation that, that we have this, these two things that are, are real, are happening here, is sin will never go unpunished and a person will never stand before God justified without absolute righteousness. That's why we need the cross. That's why we need the work of the cross. That's why we need what Jesus did on the cross. And so... The only way we can stand before God and his holiness is for another's righteousness to be given to us because we can't do it ourselves. And that's where Christ, his perfect life, his perfect obedience, the Lamb of God who was spotless, stainless, and holy and blameless lived an absolutely perfect life. Scholars talk about this and they call it Christ, his, his active obedience and Christ in his passive obedience. And what they mean by that is, is Jesus Christ lived his active obedience. He lived an absolutely righteous life according to the law. Jesus obeyed all 613 commandments without one violation in thought, motive, and deed. Jesus only did what his father said to do. 
So because of his perfect life of obedience as a man, you know, he's the God-man, but as a man incarnated in human flesh, Christ lived this perfect life obeying the 613 commandments of the law in perfect, absolute obedience. And he obeyed the Father in perfect, absolute obedience, only doing what the Father said to do. Because of his obedient life, Jesus was the only man in history that has ever been justified by obeying the law. And he has to give us that righteousness else we will not be able to come into God's holy presence. Christ, his passive obedience, is referring to his substitutionary death on the cross. This is really applying uh, three different components of the cross that we need to understand. Is number one, is on the cross, Jesus became like sinful flesh. The sins of the world were imputed to him. I'm going to talk about this in deeper in a minute. Number two is Jesus became a sin offering, or he became the atoning sacrifice. And then number three, God judged sin in the flesh when Jesus was crucified as, as a propiti propitiatory sacrifice. Let's talk about in more detail, Jesus became like sinful flesh. If you read, if you read in the Old Testament... You see, you see the scapegoat. And that on the Day of Atonement, what would happen is there would be two goats. The high priest would, would, on the Day of Atonement, would take the sins of the nation of Israel and lay hands on the goat and send the scapegoat out into the wilderness to take away the sins of Israel for a year. And they would take another goat and they would sacrifice that goat and sprinkle the blood of that goat on the, um, on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And so if you read clearly here, um, if, you, if you read Isaiah 53.1, it talks about that, that the Messiah would bear the iniquity of us all. He, he is that scapegoat. He is that, he became like sinful flesh. Just like the high priest imparted or imputed the sins of the nation to that goat, the father, when Jesus was on the cross, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, our sins were imputed to Christ. He became that scapegoat who took away our sins. He became that scapegoat to whom the sins of the world were imputed. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That was, the, the, the scapegoat was obviously foreshadowing Christ. I love how in the law, you know, sometimes Leviticus can be, you know, I hear people, they're reading through the Bible you know, throughout the whole Bible, and when they get to Leviticus, they're like, oh, man. And I'm like, yeah, that, that can, Leviticus can be really hard to read. But when you see the beauty of this foreshadowing of the scapegoat, foreshadowing the Messiah, Christ, being that scapegoat to whom the sins of the world were imputed, and he took those sins away in his crucifixion. You're, you're just looking at God going, wow. God laid out those types and shadows in the law. In Romans 8, 3, Paul was writing, and he obviously has this, this idea of the scapegoat in mind on the Day of Atonement. And he says, what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son. In the likeness of sinful flesh, that's where we're getting into the sins of the world, past, present, future, of everyone who would ever live, were imputed to Jesus Christ. He became sin. He became like sinful flesh. He never became a sinner, obviously, but he became like sinful flesh as the Father imputed the sins or credited the sins of the world to Christ. And he says, as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. See, Christ did not have the body that we have. We have inherited a, a body laden with sin. We have inherited a body from Adam that is depraved. Scholars call this total depravity, the sinful condition of humanity. There is none righteous. That doesn't mean we can't do anything good or we, we're just wicked to the core or we're all like Hitler. That's not what it means, but it means we're, we're inclined to be selfish and sinful because of the sin of Adam that was passed down 
through the generations and also imputed because Adam was the head of the, the first covenant in Scripture. It talks about that in Romans 5. But Paul is saying that, that our, sin, or our sins on that cross were imputed to Christ. He became like that scapegoat on the Day of Atonement who took away the sins of Israel, except what, he took away our sins forever. The second thing we're talking about here is Jesus became the atoning sacrifice. Jesus became the atoning sacrifice. And if, you, if you take this word in Romans 8, 3, where it says he became an offering for sin, it's actually the Greek word used in the Old Testament in the Septuagint. Don't want to get too fancy here. But in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament to mean sin offering. And so Paul is clearly saying, okay, the sin offering in the Old Testament, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the sin offering on the Day of Atonement. His cross, his crucifixion was the ultimate sin atonement. And so what Paul is saying here is, is that he became that atoning sacrifice. See, here's the thing we miss in the, in the 21st century is we miss how bloody and how gory and how, I mean, just the worship system of Israel was bloody and gory Guts everywhere. I mean, it smelled like the best barbecue place you could ever imagine whenever you smell that, the brisket cooking in, on, on the altar. But, you know, but it was bloody. It was gory. You know, we, we, don't, we don't think about how bloody and gory and how messy it was. And it shows us the seriousness of our sin before God, that, that the, this, the, the, the requirements of the law meant that Things were messy, things were bloody, things were gory, and it was, it was foreshadowing this, the price that God's eternal son would pay on the cross. John Stott is a theologian. I just want to read what he wrote about atonement. It's, a, it's an incredible statement as he summarized what it means, what atonement means, and John Stott said this, the biblical gospel of atonement is of God satisfying himself by substituting himself for us. That's so beautiful. The concept of substitution may be said then to lie at the heart of both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin, listen to this, the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives that belong to God alone. God accepts penalties that belong to man alone. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that is just an incredible Holy Spirit inspired statement. When we talk about the atonement of Christ, when we talk about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we've got to think that, um, like, we've got to think three words. They all start with S. Substitute, sacrifice, and satisfaction. Jesus Christ, like I just read, Jesus Christ became the substitute. Jesus Christ substituted himself where we deserve to be on that cross, experiencing God's wrath and judgment. He sacrificed himself on the cross. And his sacrifice, listen, his sacrifice has satisfied God. The blood of Jesus Christ has satisfied God. It should satisfy us. We should, if you're in Christ, no matter, and if you're in Christ and you're genuinely wanting to walk in the spirit, if you're genuinely wanting to put your death, your, yourself, your cross, your flesh to death, to, to live by his life, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. 
Because the blood of Christ has satisfied God, it should satisfy us. Therefore, we should not be bound by accusations or self-judgment. That doesn't mean we can live however we want. I'm not saying that. But, but if we're genuinely wanting to walk in the Holy Spirit, we're genuinely wanting to live by his life, then, then we've got to understand the blood of Jesus is enough to shatter and break all condemnation so that we understand we can approach God's presence in confidence. And when we talked about at the beginning, only atonement, only by atonement can we come into the presence of a holy God. But it talks about in Hebrews, approach his presence, the throne of grace, with confidence because the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has satisfied God. Praise the Lord for that. Sin judged on the cross. Paul said in Romans 8.3 that... That, the, that Jesus became like sinful flesh and he condemned sin in the flesh as Jesus hung on the cross. So what Paul's saying here is when Jesus became sin, God judged sin in the body of Jesus. The wrath and judgment we deserved was directed upon Christ. Christ experienced the wrath and the judgment we deserve because sin was, God judged sin in the body of Jesus Christ. This word condemned in the Greek, if you, if you study it out, this word condemned in the Greek is sometimes used in um, Mark 16, 6 and 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two. 32. It's used for unbelievers who will experience God's wrath in hell. The judgment Jesus experienced on the cross was God's wrath directed in our place or directed because of us, but, but he is the one who experienced it. He took the penalty we deserve so that we would not have to pay it. What an incredible Messiah. What an incredible Christ. What an incredible Lord that he would, he would suffer God's wrath for us and the judgment we deserve. He would suffer it for us so that we would not have to suffer that in hell. So there's a theologian named Leroy Four Lines. He was writing about this idea about the, the judgment, the wrath of God um, expressed upon Christ or released upon Christ. And he said this, it is a mistake to restrict the sufferings of Jesus Christ to that which the Roman soldiers inflicted on him. The death Jesus Christ suffered by the crucifixion was the least part of his suffering. His own father inflicted the greatest suffering that was inflicted on him. He took the place of sinners before God and drank the cup of wrath that was due sinners. He suffered as much on the cross as sinners will suffer in an eternal hell. He experienced separation from the Father. He took the penalty we deserve in hell on the cross from the Father as God the Father judged sin in the body of Jesus Christ. And so this idea is driven home further if we look back to Romans 3.25 what well, we started out with and we were at the very beginning of this message where Paul talked about propitiation. It's a big word, but it's a very important word. It's not really a word we use in our normal vocabulary, but this word propitiation. Paul said, whom God, talking about Christ, Christ on the cross, whom God disp displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Now, that's a big word, but what that word means is, is it means an appeasing or a placating force. It's an appeasing or a placating force. And so what this really means in a New Testament context is that, that the cross of Jesus Christ turned away God's wrath, listen, because justice has been satisfied. God's holiness demanded justice. The cross and the, and the judgment Jesus experienced on the cross satisfied 
the justice of God, that his, his wrath has been satisfied, and now we can be restored into favor with God. What an incredible plan. What an incredible gospel. What incredible love for us. If we ever doubt, does God love me? Just look at the cross and the price Christ paid to purchase your sins and to take your sins away and to take them away forever. This word propitiation is, is, a, is, a, is used to descri- in, the, in the book of Hebrews to describe the mercy seat. You know, when the Ark of the Covenant, on, when the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, where two cherubim were facing one another, and the mercy seat is the same word for propitiation. And on the Day of Atonement, when they took the, the law, remember the law was inside the Ark of the Covenant, and they sprinkled the blood of the goats on the mercy seat as a propitiation to say that the law has been satisfied. And so the law has, you know, summarized by the Ten Commandments. And the law shows two things. It shows the the need for absolute righteousness to approach God, and it shows also the penalty, the severe penalty that that must be paid if anyone breaks the law. And so when the when the, the high priest took the blood of the goat and appropriated on the mercy seat, on the propitiation, the propitiation seat, so to speak, it was saying and it was communicating the law has been satisfied. Both the absolute righteousness has been satisfied and the penalty of sin has been satisfied. But they had to do that every single year. But now Christ when he entered the more perfect tabernacle, that is the tabernacle in heaven, and he took not the blood of, bu- of bulls and goats and, and whatever else they sacrificed, birds and whatever. Go through all the lists. He took his own blood. He took his own blood, and he put his own blood on the mercy seat of the ark in heaven, and he said, forever... The need for absolute righteousness has been satisfied in the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the perfect life of Jesus Christ. And now he also said the need for the penalty to be paid, the penalty of eternal separation from God to be paid, that also has been been satisfied. God's justice has been met. God's holiness has been met. And now in Christ, sinners can look to him and forever be forgiven, forever be righteous, forever be justified, forever be saved and going to heaven in Christ. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Incredible. The gospel is an incredible Good news, incredibly good news. He has satisfied. Jesus Christ is the propitiatory sacrifice. He is a sacrifice that has satisfied God's need for justice. God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Again, John Stott was talking about the pro- Christ being the propitiation. And he said this, God's own great love propitiated his own holy wrath through the gift of his dear son who took our place, bore our sin, he died our death. Thus God gave himself Thus God himself gave himself to save us from himself. That is incredible. This is the righteous basis on which the righteous God can righteous the unrighteous without compromising his righteousness. Say that again with your tongue held and you might say a cuss word. It's a tongue twister. Let me say it again. This is the righteous basis on which the righteous God can righteous the unrighteous, listen, without compromising his righteousness. That's the wisdom of the cross. That's the beauty of the cross. That is God being just, that his justice is still released. God being just 
and him being the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. The beauty, the wonder, the wisdom, the glory of the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. He is just, amen. He is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's talk about for a minute now justification. That to, that, that's the cross from God's perspective. That's, when, that's why God had to go to the extremes of the cross. From God's perspective, he had to remain just. But from our perspective, what justification means, he is a God of justice and justification. He's a God of holiness and a God of love. The beauty and the wonder of the cross of Jesus Christ. Justification by faith. Paul said in Romans 5, 16, he said the free gift. And if you look in context, Paul's talking about imputed righteousness. The, the, we talked about that, that that active obedience of Christ, perfect obedience to the law, perfect obedience to the Father, that righteousness of Christ credited to your account. That's, that's what imputed righteousness means. The free gift of imputed righteousness arose from many transgressions, and that gift of, of righteousness, that gift of imputed righteousness credited to your account results in justification. In other words, think about it like this. I use this analogy a lot, but let's say that I'm going into foreclosure and I owe $1,000 on my mortgage and I don't have in my bank account, I have $0 in my bank account and my dad goes and he pays the mortgage company directly that $1,000 to the mortgage company. They don't care whether it was me or my dad that paid it. All they care about is in my mortgage account, $1,000 has been credited. See, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, his absolute righteousness is credited to your account in the eyes of God, and therefore he renders you and reckons you justified in his sight. On the condition of faith, not by any works you could do, not by anything you could ever do. It is a free gift of God. It is a free gift of that, that works cannot earn this. You cannot do enough or obey enough or, you know, give enough or go work, you know, to feed the poor enough to earn this gift. It's free. It's the free gift of God's grace that he gives by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Justification involves two concepts. Number one, the declaration of righteousness. See, justification is not just you're forgiven of your sins. That's pardon. Justification goes a step further and says, you have a new righteous status. You are righteous in Christ. As long as you are in Christ, you are righteous. Now, we've talked about that doesn't mean actual sanctified righteousness that takes a lifetime but in Christ if you are in Christ you are have a status of righteousness before God of absolute righteousness as if you obeyed all 613 commandments of the law the second thing about justification is that it releases you from the penalty the guilt or the penalty of the punishment your sin deserved so not only are you have a status of being righteous, but you are released from the penalty your sin deserves, which we know is hell. What an incredible gospel this is. Justification makes you as if you had never sinned. So just imagine here for a second what it's like. Imagine here for a second what it's like um, as a sinner. So just imagine on, on this side, my, my right side, I guess that would be your left. My, my right, your left. You have a column called credits. And on my left, you have a column called debits. And the sinner who's not in Christ has two debits on their account. They owe God absolute righteousness. And they owe God the payment of eternal death 
for the penalty of sin. And because they have no credits on the right-hand side, they are stamped upon that ledger condemned. That describes everyone who is not in Christ, everyone who has not put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now imagine that same ledger, debits over here, absolute righteousness, debits over here, eternal death, credits now, because once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, his righteousness, his absolute righteousness is now credited to your account so you have his absolute righteousness. And also, the death he paid as that, as that substitute, the penalty he paid, that, that sacrifice he paid, that eternal death he paid is now credited to your account. So on your account, you have what God demands, both absolute righteousness and the payment for death to have been paid is now on your account. And God, seeing that you are in Christ, stamps upon you justified, just as if you had never sinned. That's the glory of the gospel. That's the book of Romans. What I just shared is basically Romans 1 through Romans 5, the glory of justification by faith that Christ, who knew no sin, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, how do I get that righteousness credited to my account? By faith, on the condition of faith. You look to Christ and you say, he is who he says he is. He is God. He is Savior. He is Messiah. Yes, he finished that work on my behalf and when, I, when, I, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he then justifies you and credits his righteousness to your account so that now stamped upon you is the words justified and all who are justified will escape God's wrath. You will either pay for your penalty for sin in hell or Jesus will pay it for you on the cross. But it will be paid. And the question is, has that been paid? Has he paid it in full? When he said, it is finished on the cross, those three incredible words, it is finished. When he said, it is finished on the cross, has it been finished in your account? Do you have the righteousness of Christ and do you have his substitutionary death credited to your account? I just want you, as we bring this message to a close, just want you to think about that. Who are you trusting for salvation? Is it your good works? Is it the things you've done in God's name? Is it the things trying to obey him? Or is it a complete trust in Christ, that his work has finished it, and therefore I'm putting my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and I'm trusting him. See, faith is not just a mental assent where we agree. See, faith is not just saying, okay, I agree with everything you say. Mentally, faith is the condition of the heart that puts your trust in this person with your very uh, life and your salvation saying, Lord, save me because I'm a sinner. And so if you, have no, if, you, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I just, you know, we're going to end the online portion, but I just want to encourage you just to pray with me. In fact, we'll just do it while we stay online here. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, what we're going to do is you, you can pray online, you can pray in person. I'm just going to say, you know, some people talk about the sinner's prayer, whatever. Just, just if, if, you, if you mean it from the heart, I believe God sees it. I really do. <clears throat> it's not a magic prayer that saves you. It's God who saves you. It's God who saves you. God sees the response of your heart. It's not like this perfect prayer. But if you, if you, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, or if you have even slid in away and backslid in away and want to renew your faith, just pray after me. Let's just close our eyes bow our heads here 
Father, we just come, just, uh, we just come right now and we thank you for the wonder of the cross. We thank you, God, for justice and justification. Lord, the glory of the cross that you paid the price that we deserved, you paid it for us in full. And we, when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, are justified, declared righteous, and our payment for sin has been paid. I just want to invite you if, you, if you want to receive Christ today, just to pray with me. Just to, you can put it in your own words. You can just whisper it to the Lord. But Father, I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I recognize that when he was on the cross, he paid the penalty I deserved on the cross. I recognize that he lived an absolutely perfect life. And I say, God, I am a sinner and I need Christ. I need him. I need to be saved. I need for, I need for Christ to save me. Lord, I come. I'm kind of going fast, sorry. <clears throat> Lord, I come and I acknowledge my sins. I am a sinner. Lord, I acknowledge my sins. I repent of my sins. I recognize that I can no longer live the way I've been living because I've, I've experienced God. And I acknowledge my sin and I confess my sins to you. And on the condition of faith and repentance, I put my trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and a Savior. And I say, Lord, would you come in and would you save me? Would you save me from my sins? And would you justify me? Would you make me righteous in Christ? I pray that in the name of Jesus. If, if you prayed that prayer or tried to pray, I was kind of going fast. <clears throat> Should have got Angie to do the children's version. But um, <clears throat> if you prayed that prayer either online, um, in person here, just if you're online, just email us and let us know. If you're in person, just come see me afterwards. Um, definitely want to know. But we just say, as we bring this to a close, we just say, Lord, how grateful we are. Let us never lose sight of the wonder of the cross of Jesus Christ and the justice that was satisfied within God and the justification that you gave us in Christ. Lord, I pray as we go out today, Lord, as we go out to spend time with family and friends and things like that, that we would, we would carry the message of the cross within our heart today ever grateful, ever thankful for what you did for us. Yes, there's a, there's a need to be made ready, but let us today on this day just rest in the finished work of the cross and the glory of what you did for us as our substitute, saving us from yourself by substituting, you, substituting yourself in a, uh, where we deserve to be. Father, I pray for all who listen and all who are here, Lord, that you would just release your blessings, the blessings of your presence upon every family, upon every person. Lord, that there might be a deeper experience of fellowship with the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, we'll end it online. Um.